<clears throat> All right. Just give people a few minutes to enter. Got a few people in, so give it a few more minutes, a couple more minutes. Yeah, it took your time, brother. Yeah, we're live now, but just giving it a few minutes. Got like six people in. Wait for a few more people come in and then we'll start. Sounds good, sounds good. <clears throat> All right, everybody in the chat, um, can you hear us? Okay, just give me a, a why or or something, just confirmation that you can hear. All right. Hey, Malik, you ready? Yes, sir. All right, guys. So welcome to week one of our intro to day trading course. It's also day trading, investing. We're pretty much going to do a little bit of everything. We're going to do day trading. We're going to talk about investing. We're going to talk about swing trade strategies. We're going to go over NFTs, metaverse, crypto. Um, we got multiple guests, a great lineup. So the purpose of this is to give you an introduction to day trading, swing trade, and kind of give you that foundation. I think it's something that you can build on. And I'm going to have Malik. He's going to be a co-host pretty much. Hopefully every week he'll be on here and he has years of experience. So anything where I'm lacking, uh, we're going to be able to share each other and kind of bounce off of each other. We have some modules today. He's not going to be able to go on camera. He is traveling from he's in he's, he's in traveling this week, so he's kind of busy. But he kind of graced us with time to jump on and, and just share his insight. And Malik, if you want to uh, just briefly introduce yourself. Hey, guys, what's up? My name is Malik. Um, you know, pre-med student. Became a trader after I graduated uh, full time. But I was trading while I was in college. Um, taught hundreds of people how to trade. Um, <clears throat> Uh, taught over, you know, 300 people. Now it's probably like around 450. I developed a team of qualified traders to kind of build with me and my brother, who is going to be the 16th, my brother Juan. Um, you know, we ge generated a lot of money, um, a lot of profits, but that's after years and years of experience. So I want you guys to know that this isn't something that's quick money, right? You want to understand it. You want to learn it. You want to give before you can get, right? So you want to kind of give the market <clears throat> some time for you to learn it, right? Um, also have a hedge fund, building properties, um, building property uh, companies, portfolios for people. Um, so that's kind of what we like to do uh, here at NAR. And I know Juan was doing a free class for his brothers that are on YouTube. So I was very interested in, you know, kind of growing that because I really it's not really about signing up to something it's just about actually helping people understand <clears throat> the market and that's kind of what we're doing here today so uh, Juan I really appreciate you for this um, opportunity no no problem thanks for having me I mean, oh thanks for coming on actually thanks for having me <laughs> absolutely so so we have here the intro program so this is just a quick disclaimer um, so I wrote here kind of like the way I think the best way to learn, if you want to be a good day trader or swing trader, kind of this like medical school format and, and the brother knows the whole process of going to medical school, you start off with your undergrad, right? And to me, that's this, right? Kind of getting like an intro to just overall markets, having an understanding, knowing some terminology, knowing some basic things. And then when you get into medical school, right, your first two years is all classroom. And that's kind of like an advanced, advanced kind of like 
uh, program where you're learning uh, uh, different formations, different different strategies like that you can apply in the market. And then the last two years of medical school is you're like your clinical. And that's like where your paper trading is to me. Like that's the time you should like start taking your theories and make them practical, kind of like paper trading. And then when you even when, when you graduate med school, you got to, you know, uh, shadow a doctor, follow a doctor, you know, practice actual medicine under a doctor. And that's where I think, you know, when kind of like when you finish all this, your paper trading, you should still learn with someone, have like a mentor and just like share your ideas, share your trades just to kind of like perfect your craft. So that's that's how I, my idea of how you should learn day trading. We're going to hit all these modules. Uh, the, today, we're going to go over market indices, trading methodology, terminology, and not only just learning these things, learning how to implement them. How do they look when you actually trade? And as far as bonus education, we have Malik here. He's going to be co-hosting. Next week, Sean from We Are Investing is going to come. Another great swing trader. Uh, been on is on YouTube. Really informed. Really w does knows like market trends. Snapback CPA will be on next week, and that's when save you know all your questions that you have with taxes if you're going to day trade how does that work with taxes what is the wash rule uh if i swing trade how does that affect my taxes if i make whatever i make at the end of the year just any questions with taxes if you have a 401 question about taxes you know save it for the snapback cpa he's an actual accountant and he's going to be on stock curry he has a youtube channel pretty big pretty big on youtube also he's going to do an option boot camp Tom Nash is huge on YouTube. He's also worked in Wall Street for years, worked for big investment companies, really well known, great uh, with fundamentals and ratios and understanding what a good value stock is or a good growth stock. We have uh, brother Mahmoud Omar from NFT PhD, and he's going to help with crypto, metaverse, NFTs. And then we're going to have uh, Penny Slayer coming in from Lucrament Investing, and he's going to also talk about um, the importance of a investing community and different resources. I also want to add, um, you know, technical fundamental analysis, just from a very general standpoint. Um, technical analysis is where you're analyzing the charts, the indicators, volume, things like that. Right? I just want to have everyone to have a separate understanding. Fundamental analysis is where you look at the company. How much money does the company make? How much money is the company worth? Is it overvalued? Is it undervalued? how to tell right so when we put the technical analysis and the fundamental analysis together right that's what gives us a solid understanding and a higher probability of okay this stock actually has a lot of potential or this stock doesn't really have a lot of potential but it would have a lot of potential if it came to this price level right so that's kind of what we do here that's that's the main you know bread and butter of trading stocks at least maybe not crypto maybe not forex but stocks in general technical analysis and fund the the fundamental analysis you'll be learning in this uh in this course <clears throat> is going to give you the you know the the one and two putting together and that's kind of where you have um you can make your decision right your higher probability decision into okay yeah this is going to be a move absolutely so the first topic we're going to talk about market indices. So this is just kind of like a history of the stock market started actually started like in 1602 when they started trading paper shares. Then it came to Wall Street in 1792. So the stock market, the concept of the stock market has been around for quite a long time. And it's basically you have a public company and they want to raise money. They want to get bigger. They want to expand. So they sell a portion of their company and we buy those portions in shares. Uh, private companies, they can still raise money, but it's not traded publicly. They do like their crowdfunding stuff. And, and um, that's kind of like what you see when you buy a share. So what is a market index? So a market index, it acts like a barometer. So, you know, when, when we're trading, right, <clears throat> we're, we want to find as many things as we can in our, in our favor. Like if we're going to trade a stock, and we see it coming down to support and we we predict that, OK, if it hits the support, I'm going to buy it and I think it's going to reverse and go up. So before you do that, you want to make sure that there's a lot of things in your favor. So one of the things you can do is you can look at the market index. And if stocks are uptrending, then maybe, you know, that's that just adds to your thesis. 
to me, when I'm getting into a trade, I'm building a thesis, right? And I'm and I want to add more things to just confirm, yes, I should go. And these are this is one thing. So how does it look if you want to invest like in the market index as just for investment? Like the SPY, the NASDAQ. Let's say you just don't want to waste your time picking stocks. You just want to invest in an index. That's that's perfectly fine. If you're especially if you're younger, you know, historically market index like the SPY, they've had like seven to ten percent uh yield uh, of profit every year. So let's say you're able to save five hundred dollars a month and you do that for like 30 years and you just put it in an index every month. I mean, you're you're talking about saving 1.4, 1.5 million dollars with the growth. So investing in an index is good if you want to do it long term. Um, it's good also if you want to kind of get an idea of what the trend of the, the market is. And that one ticker gives you exposure to a lot of stocks. So like the SPY, the S&P 500, it's 500 companies in that one ticker, in that one index. And it gives you exposure to that, to that ticker. Um, do you, uh, Malik, do you use kind of like the 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 market index yourself also to to see just kind of get, get an idea of what the direction is? If it's a bearish market, bullish market, should I should I you know should I be bullish? Should I be buying puts? Yeah. So what I would normally do is like let's say if I'm looking at a stock um, in the S and P 500, S and P 500 is an index, and the S and P 500 is moving up, and I see a stock that is moving downward, I would typically not touch that stock. But if I see the S&P 500 moving upward and I see a stock moving upward and they kind of look very similar in their movements, right? Anytime this one pops, that one has a sort of move. Anytime this one has <clears throat> a drop, that one had a drop as well during the day. You could see that it's moving relatively the same or relatively similar. So then th when you want to pick something that's moving with the index, that's moving with the side of the index. And why I like to do that is because when I see a stock that isn't moving with the index, let's say the index is moving upward. This stock would be moving downward slowly, and then it would have little pops of upward. So there isn't much potential in making money. But when the stock market is moving up and you're in a stock that is bullish, there is a higher probability that the stock will continue to move bullish. If you're watching an index and it's bearish, it wouldn't make sense to play a stock that's bullish because it's not going to move as strong as you would expect it to if it was moving along with the market. Because every stock is kind of controlled, the market is the market is controlled by every stock and almost sort of vice versa, right? Because of fear and greed and the emotion that goes into it. So if you watched like SPY and Facebook, so similar for the past few weeks, right? So you kind of like want to catch that and be like, okay, since I seen the, this connection between these two, I think this would be the more high probable trade that I would take um, instead of this stock Netflix that's been dropping and it hasn't been making a very clear move for me, you know? <clears throat> yeah. Absolutely. So here's a couple charts. So we see here, right? We have the Tesla, Tesla, for example, you see the up movement and you see the spy up movement. So like, let's say, you know, I want to trade Tesla and I'm bullish on Tesla. You know, I, I think, I think it's going to bounce off this moving average. And I say, when it bounces here, I think it's going to find support here. And then it's going to start to go up, right? If I'm building like a case to go for a swing trade or a day trade, um, but you know, Powell comes out and says, oh, we're going to have another interest spike or, or whatever. And, you know, something happens where the overall, overall market is down, right? Then even though I feel like, okay, this area has been support in the past. And, and what I mean by that, if support and resistance is new, just areas where historically it's tapped and then buyers come in and then it reverses. This is how people usually like kind of the foundation when they form their swing trade thesis or their day trades thesis, they look back days, they look back weeks, they look back months, and they want to see areas where the stock has gone down, tap that area, and then buyers have came come in. They want to buy in that area to kind of catch the wave upside. But let's say I'm building my thesis. I'm going to buy here if it comes down to 838. And then the overall market, because of the news, because of all this interest, starts 
dumping going down, then maybe I should hold off because I don't, maybe that area is not going to hold as support anymore. And that's kind of how people build their cases around like market indices. Uh, but in general, like for long-term investors, it's also a good idea to pick a good index and just invest in it and, and you should be safe. So we start, uh, anything else you want to add Malik? No, nope. kind of got it all really. Okay, cool, cool. So the next thing is, here, we see some keywords. I know you hear a lot, a lot of times you hear market capitalization, market cap, right? So stocks are categorized by their market cap. And what is market cap? Market cap is basically the outstanding shares and the outstanding shares are the shares circulating that we can buy times the stock price. So if, for example, you know, there's a, a company that has 2 million shares uh, circulating, right? I, I have a company, it's called XYZ, and I share I sell 2 million shares to the public. And now each share is uh, trading for $100. Then you would multiply the 2 million times 100 shares, and that market cap would be 200 million. And that gives you an idea of how the, the size of the company. And it gives you an idea of the value of the company. But there's two types of way you can value a company. They value the company by the market cap, which is how people value it, right? Because this is even though, let's say, uh, a company is trading for, for $300 a share or whatever, it doesn't really mean that that's the true value of the company. That's the value that people are paying for it based off the share price, based off the share circulating. There's also a thing called enterprise value, which takes into account the market cap, but it also takes into account the debt of the company and the equity of the company. And that gives a little bit more accurate you know, way of understanding the, the true value of a company. So market cap is basically, like we said, number of shares outstanding times the share price. Um, enterprise value is market cap times market value of preferred shares, total debt uh, minus uh, cash and equivalents. So, um, so a lot of people, so why is this important? For day trading, there's some uh, traders that trade mostly penny stocks. So penny stocks, um, they come with their risks, but they, they're high risk, high reward. So there's some people that like trading penny stocks, like a lot of momentum traders, because of the volatility. If you have a penny stock, right? And let's say there's a you know small penny stock and they have... Uh, a million shares circulating, like a million share float. That's the amount of shares that are out there that people can buy. So this would be considered a low float penny stock. And what some day trading communities do, they buy these stocks. And because they have so many people in their community, it the stock spikes up. You know, you see like a, a $3 spike, $3 company, a $3 share company go to like $10 or $7, which is, you know, double in, in a couple hours, a couple minutes sometimes. Because it's all supply and demand, right? If a company only has a million shares circulating and 10,000 people buy a thousand shares each or 2,000 shares each, then the supply and demand is going to cause that, that company, uh, that stock ticker to spike up. As opposed to a large cap company, like let's say Bank of America, they have millions and millions and millions of shares circulating. So it's going to take so many people to cause that spike. So a lot of day traders do trade penny stocks. Um, they're very risky. I, I don't trade them too often uh, because of the risk that's, that comes with it. I don't know if you're big on penny stocks, Malik. Penny stocks? Yeah, but that's only when the market is like showing me like the smaller stocks are growing. But it's penny stocks aren't what I day trade. I would invest in them for the long term. What I day trade are more like stocks that have volume and volatility. For sure. Okay. But what I like about it is, you know, if a penny stock, let's say it's $200 million market cap. And then we go, we look at uh, a market cap of $200 billion, right? So if I added $20 million into $200 million company, we'll see a 10% move. If we added the same $20 million in a $200 billion market cap, we're not going to see that stock move at all. So that's kind of the difference between, you know, if someone was to dump this much, and it, why that market cap is important. Yeah, absolutely. So, and here it tells you like penny stocks are typically any stocks lower than $5. Uh, small cap stocks are 300 million to 2 billion. 
uh, mid cap two to 10 billion and large cap 10 billion or higher. Uh, typically like investors, like, like long-term investors, they're, they're going to go with the larger caps because it comes with less risk. So this is an example of what we were talking about market index. We have the S and P 500. It represents 500 companies. It's the ticker symbol SPY. So if you wanted to buy this, you just type in the ticker SPY and it gives you exposure to these 500 companies. And there's some people that are more than happy to just invest in the SPY and just do that every month. And 30 years later, they have a nice, nice little nest egg. Um, these are some key words. If you're new, new to market and you hear them so you don't get confused when we say bear market, um, we're, we're talking about we believe that the stock prices are going to depreciate in value. Stock prices are, are going down. When we say we're bullish, it's a bullish market. We believe that stock prices are appreciating in value and stock prices are going up. And these are some chart examples of different indices. Uh, I mean, well, the SPY, the SPY with Facebook and Microsoft, you see how similar they move. You see the, 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 the big, this is during COVID, the big drop and then the, the rally back up, the drop and then up, up, up. And you see here, Facebook had the big drop and then the rally back up and kind of like the same triangle format here. And then you see Microsoft here, big drop during the COVID, then the rally back up. So that's why we're talking. That's that's why a lot of swing traders and day traders they want to see what the market indices are doing to give them an overall kind of barometer of how the market is doing. So if the overall market feels bearish, then maybe they're not going to be bullish, even if they they feel like okay, Facebook is dropping, it's dropping to a good price of support. Um, I think I'm going to avoid it because I want to I want to see the overall market to be I want to see the overall market to become bullish again. So that, that's kind of how you can use it if you're day trading, swing trading. And the Nasdaq, uh, it, it focuses mostly on the Apple's and Facebook's global electronic marketplace for buying and selling as uh, so it's different than the S&P 500. Uh, you know, this is uh, um, uh uh, this is where you'll find the, those tech giants like the Apples and the Facebooks and all, all that. And we said we talked about ETF and it's a basket of securities that you can buy or sell through a bookish form or a stock exchange. So then we have the the I've heard I know you've heard this term, the FANG stocks. And basically, what is a FANG? It's an acronym used to for some of the most prominent companies in the tech sector. So when you hear FANG, they're talking about the most prominent companies in the tech sector. So right now, FANG is Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Alphabet, uh, Google. So that that's just a uh, um, you know uh, terminology you may you may have heard in the past, so you can have an idea. So that was just a brief introduction on market indices. Um, that was kind of just uh, uh, module one. I don't know if uh, Malik, you have anything else? Cover it all, really. <clears throat> but I like to trade uh, the uh, the indices for sure. Absolutely. So trading methodology, module two here. I want to get into a little bit, uh, you know, some terminology, things that you hear. And again, these are introductions. Later on, we'll be getting into more of the technical stuff, how to find support, how to find resistance, uh, a good, good different uh, swing trade strategies. But right now, we're just kind of getting the, the basis and the foundation and some terminology that you're going to hear throughout the modules. Uh, that way, you're, you're familiar with them. So you may have heard swing trader and you may have heard day trader. So a day trader, we're buying and selling securities the same day, sometimes within seconds, sometimes within minutes. There's some day traders that all they do is scalp like momentum stocks. So they may jump in a stock when it's trading at $3 and then... Five seconds later, it's at 320 and they sell. It doesn't sound like a lot, right? Yeah. It goes up 20 cents. But if you have 5,000 shares, those 20 cents uh, mean $1,000 that you just made in profit. Yes. Yeah, and so there's some. Right. Yeah. All yeah. right. So, what I would normally do is I'd go in a position and it's called scalping. You go in for like nothing more than like five minutes, maybe even 30 seconds to a minute. You go in with 20,000, you come out with 24,000, right? You make. A small five percent gain, but on that or twenty percent gain, but on your money because it's a lot, it ends up being a good return. Yeah. So 
day trade uh, swing day trading comes with its risk. You have to you have to be in front of the your computer. Obviously, you can't take a day trade and look away from your computer because you know so there's these rock these stocks that you're day trading in sometimes make quick moves. So you can jump in and it can drop quickly. Uh, some day traders do like hotkeys, right, where they press two buttons on their keyboard and they buy their shares immediately, and then they press two buttons on their keyboard and they're out of the position immediately. Uh, it's very stressful. I've been involved in day trading close to ten years, and there's, you know, I've I've done well, but there's even with the with with doing well, there's just times where I'll just go months without day trading because I don't need the stress. Uh, and there's some people that it's not stressful for them; they love it. Uh, but it's 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 not for everybody. I don't mind day trading every once in a while. Um, and that's kind of it. So day trading is intraday. You're buying a stock. You're selling it the same day. Uh, and we'll go over different strategies and different things for day trading. Swing trading, it's it's the same concept of day trading, right? People are looking at a stock, but they're looking at it from a little bit farther lens than a day trade. They're looking at it over days, over weeks, and they're looking at the trend of a stock. Let's say like PayPal, right? It's fallen so much. And it may fall to an area where we are talking about a support where every time it hits this low support in the past, people have bought in. So your thesis is, OK, when it drops down to one hundred dollars five times in the last three years, every time it hit that hundred dollars, it reversed and, and rallied up to one hundred and twenty dollars. So you look at that and you say, OK, I'm going to buy if it lands in one hundred and twenty dollars. And I need some further confirmation, whether that's like a bullish candle or some other symbol. And I jump in and I say, OK, it's going to take a few days or a few weeks. I'm going to hold it until it gets close to that 120. And why that 120? Because you say in the past when it hit that 120, it reversed like people sold it when it got to 120. Um, and that's kind of like the, the thesis usually for swing trade. Other strategies for swing trade. Some people buy the what they say, buy the rumors, sell the news, right? So let's say you're, inve you're you're doing a swing trade on a pharmaceutical company that potentially has FDA approval company coming. Now that's very very high risk and very 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 high reward. I have a video I did was BLRX and I did do a lot of research and uh, it was a FDA approval type of pharmaceutical company. And I read like I before I invested in it, I read all their journal reviews, I read all their peer reviews. Everything I read said, okay, this company, I read I read all their blind studies, everything. I think I really feel comfortable thinking that they're going to get FDA approval. I jumped into that stock with the knowledge that, okay, I think they're going to get FDA approval anytime now. Everything that sh everything in their study shows that they're going to get FDA approval. A couple weeks later, they got FDA approval and that stock went up 80%, 80% on one position. So you know, but if they would have not gotten FDA approval, it probably would have dropped like 40 or 50 percent. So that's where the high risk, high reward comes on those. Um, and that's just what a swing trader does. Uh, any any uh, anything add uh, between day trading and swing trading? Um, uh, uh, Malik. I personally like to do them all um, just depends on what the trade is. Right. The, the probability of the trade. Um, and I, I like I like to tell people pick a, a specific type of trader, because if you're a swing trader, you're going to have different uh, risk to reward ratios. You're going to have different risk management. You're going to have different patience when it comes to a play that is a swing compared to a, a play that is a day trade or a scalp. Right. You're going to yeah. be putting in different amounts of money. You're going to be waiting longer or shorter. Right. So it just depends on the type of person you are. Yeah. And, and there was there was a great question. So in, in in the past, right, like let's let's take away right now's time. Right. In the past, anytime there's an FDA approval, I mean, almost guaranteed that stock is going to spike. I can give you so many, so many examples. Right. And somebody asked about Sensionics and Sensionics is important because I've done probably 18, 20 videos about that company. I love this. I love Sensionics. I've been in it since under two dollars. Um, so the ups and downs don't bother me because of the position I have in. You know, it's it, it was really early, but they made a great point. They said, OK, Sensionics got FDA approval and it went down 34 percent. If Sensionics, let me uh, I'm going to you know give you a few reasons because I just did a video on that. If Sensionics would have gotten that FDA approval, let's say 10 months ago, I guarantee you that stock price that you saw probably would have tripled. So but right now, you know, they had a few things against them. 
right? Just they got the FDA approval a day after the CPI came out, the the inflation rate came out of 7.5, the highest inflation rate that we've had since Reagan, you know, like like 20 something years ago, right? So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is you have high inflation, you know that something has to be done. So they have to raise interest rates. That's going to affect. So we, Sensionics came out after the news of the CPI. Then the CEO, for some reason, he gave the 20, uh, 2022 uh, revenue, net revenue potential of 14 to 18 million for 2022. So that was his potential that he gave, which is very, very low for Sensionics. And, you know, um, some CEOs do this strategically, right? They don't want to give a, a forecast for revenue too high because then if they don't meet the expectations, it makes them look bad. But this was really, really low, 14 to 18 million for 2022. It was low because in 2018 and 2019, Sensionics made more than 18 million net revenue globally. And they didn't have this product that they have now. So Sensionics just got approved for their 180-day CGM device. CGM device is glucose monitoring device. They put like a little tracker thing in their interstitial fluids, kind of like space under their skin. And it monitors your glucose on your phone. And the, the giants of this CGM uh, uh, market are Dexacom, Abbott, and Medtronix. But their devices, you have to change it out every two weeks. So now Sensionics has a device that you don't have to change out for until 180 days. It's a great thing if you're a diabetic and it sh the stock should have uh, spiked up. But because he, because of the overall market, CPI just came out. Also, his forecast for net revenue of 2022 was extremely low. Um, I think all those things um, played a role on why the, after they got the FDA approval, Sensionics didn't spike up. But I think it's still a great company. I think it's still a hold. Okay, so that was just a, a, a tangent. I'm sorry. Uh, so day trade, swing trade. Uh, pros and cons. Swing trade is good if you are if you have a full-time job. You don't have time to sit there and day trade and stand in front of a monitor all day. So you, you, pick, a, you, pick, a, you pick a stock. You say, you know what? I like this company. It's coming into support. I think in the next couple of weeks, it's going to spike up 5, 10, 15, 20%. I'm going to take a position, whether that's in options or stocks, and I'm going to just like come back to it in a, in a, in a week or two. So you keep an eye on it. You know, you make sure nothing's changed fundamentally. You make sure that if you have like a stop loss that it didn't have your stop loss, you always have to have a plan when you swing trade or day trade, you have a stop loss, you have an area where you're going to take profits. So you want to, you kind of want to keep an eye on it and so some of the pros is the potential for significant profits. You don't have to monitor, less stress, less burnout. Uh, swing, uh, the cons of swing trading, stocks are not monitored closely and you still have risks of losses. For day trading, you have the potential of making profits. So I think with day trading, if you have like a, especially a small account, you have like $5,000, um, let's say you just put your, you and you wanna, you wanna kind of grow that in the next year or two, if you just put it in a market index or some sort of, you know, uh, uh, yeah, in a market index and it only grows, let's say you have $10,000 and it grows 10%, a 10% of 10,000 over a year is really not much profit. With day trading, I mean, you can take that 10,000 and and some people double it, triple it, quadruple it in a year. Um, I, have you seen any of your students kind of grow a small account, Malik, that you, you have an example of? Yeah, I've seen students grow it from a thousand. I think one of them has it from a thousand. It's like thirty nine thousand right now. Um, and yeah. Google, Google helped them a lot in the uh, ER swing for that. Yeah. So, so that's it. When you have a small account, you have you know just a, a higher chance of growing it much higher than than a than a market index would. Uh, but you also have a higher chance of losing, of blowing up your account and just losing it all if you don't have a strategy, if you don't have discipline. Um, and you're just kind of out there gambling and taking guesses. Uh, so this is a swing trade example that I have here, right? We were talking about, let's say this stock, you see here on the bottom, it's December, January, February, April, May, June. It's over days, over months, uh, as opposed to a day chart, you know, you see within minutes. And all these candles, let's say they represent a, a day or a week or whatever. So you're watching this, you're watching this. And you start watching it here, right? And you say, you know what? If this stock comes to this support, why is this weekly support? Because on this week, it tapped it, and then you saw it went up. On this one here, it tapped it, then it went up. 
here, it tapped it, and then it went up. So you're watching it, and your thesis is, you know what? If it taps it again, I'm going to buy in this area. But you want further confirmation, right? You don't want to buy it right here because this is a red candle. Once you see a, a positive uptrend candle here, like this one, you say, okay, I jump in this one. This is my confirmation. So I buy it here, and now I'm just holding. I'm holding it for weeks. Each of these candles represent weeks. And you may want to take profit here. Why here? Because when it tapped it here last time, it, it dropped. So you don't know that it's going to break out, right? But you know that in the past, it tapped it and then it reversed. So I say, you know what? I'm going to take half of my profit here and, and see what the next candle does. Or I'm just going to take my whole profit here because I think it's going to drop. So whatever your strategy, you know, I, I'm the type of person I would take probably 75% profit here, you know, and then keep a little bit of it, whether it's a day trading strategy or swing trading. I usually take, you know, if I know an area of resistance, I'll take majority of my profit there and then see what it does after. Because if it drops after, uh, I'm still in the green. But if it goes up after, I'm even more in the green, maybe not as much more if I would have held 100%, but, you know, I'm happy with that. And, and that's my style of trading. Um, and then you see here again, uh, it tapped support. So this is even more confirmation. You have a moving average. And, and for me, my style of trading, I like to have multiple things happening at once. So I like to jump in an area where there's a moving average. It's an area of support. There's a positive candle. And maybe, you know, on the RSI, it's oversold. On, on some other indicator, it's telling me that it's on an uptrend. So I like to do multiple things before I jump in a trade. Um, Malik, is, is that kind of your style for swing trading or you have a different style? For swing trading, I like to use uh, the overall trend, right? The primary trend. Uh, I like to use bounces off support like you have there. And I like to use the, like you also have the, the resistance of the week um, and the support of the week. Uh, the pre-market levels is what I like to use as well. Like if, if we closed above the pre-market level, then it's probably mostly swing, most likely swingable. So what I would do is I'll go on a bigger time frame and I'll see the last time this stock was actually right above this price point and what, what happened and how it reacted there. Right. And then I'll, I'll ask myself, okay, so if that happened back then where the stock dropped, why is it back here? Right. Did, is there something different in the company? Did the company release some news that gave it a good, you know, potential move? And that's why, okay, I'll take my swing trade. Why? Because it bounced off support. It broke resistance. It, uh, they released news. Uh, the economy is doing well. Once you have all of these factors together and you play devil's advocate and you can't find any reason not to take the trade, that's your trade. Yeah. So that's just kind of like a little insight of what the swing trader, you you know, Nar, he's been swing trading for a long time. I've been swing trading for a long time. Just so you have a little insight of what would make us jump into this trade. Like, like Nar said, you want all those things in your favor, right? So I'm looking at this area. I'm saying it bounced off these area like three other times. Um, the market, let's say the overall market, one of the, we checked the market indices and they're, they're bullish. So the overall trend of the market is bullish. It's the, the EMA, it's on an uptrend. Everything looked good. There's volume, this and that. Let me jump in, right? You, you, you have a high probability of success because all those other things are working in your favor as opposed to just saying, you know what? I'm going to jump here because it's this is support. Well, you have to play in all those other things to, to work in your favor. So that's kind of like a swing trade mentality. So a day trader, day trader this is this will be a day trading chart. You saw before when I pointed to the bottom on the other chart, there were days and months. Now you see that it's time. A day trader looks at a chart from minutes, right? They have a one minute chart, a five minute chart. So now instead of these bars representing one week, like the other chart that we said, it's representing one minute. So a day trader, this is, you know, let's say they see this spike right here, one minute, two minutes, three minutes, they see the spike and they want to jump in. Day traders, they look for patterns within the day. So this is a bull flag pattern, right? And you see here, right, it, it, it got this quick spike. The day trader sees this, misses the spike, and he says, okay, I'm going to look for an entry. So they start, it starts, you see a red candle, pullback, pullback. They see here, you know what, it's it's bounced off. It's, it's kind of like hit here, and then it's going back up, hit here, going back up. This right here, this will be your stop loss, right? 
you're looking at it and you want the breakout of this candle here. So you'll jump in here. This is your entry. This is called the bull flag, right? So the bull flag is you look for the first spike and then you see the first pullback. And then as the pullback happens, you're watching the pullback and your entry is the high of this first initial spike. So you see here, that's why I have entry. And they call it bull flag pattern because you see this line here like this. And if I put another line here, like here, it looks like a flag, right? So you see here, here's another example. This spike right here, I missed this spike, but I saw it because it came out on my on my uh, uh, scanner or whatever. So now I say, I'm going to wait for the first pullback. That's what a day trader usually says. They don't try to jump in the spike because they don't know when it's going to crash. They don't know if it's going to pull back and just uh, just die out. So they said, I'm going to wait for the first pullback. So this is the spike. It pulls back. And they say, I'm going to jump in on the on the break of the first on the first candle or the break of the first green candle. So we have, you know, this this could have been the entry here, this candle here, because this is the first green candle. Or some people will jump in on the high of the initial spike and then you'll jump in. The good thing about this strategy here for day traders is, you know what your entry is. You know, if it doesn't work out, what your exit is. Your exit is the low of this candle here, right? This candle here, if it, let's say it goes up, you jump in and then it dies, it, it flushes down. If it breaks below this candle, then you're, that's your exit. So you're limiting your loss. And that's what, that's what, that's what's so important with day trading. You have to be able to limit your loss because you can have, let's say this is a, a small loss of 20 cents. You can have four losses. And then your next, your next three trades are green and you can be profitable for, for the day. You can be in the green for the day overall, even though you have more losses than, 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 than gains on your, your stocks. You, if you limit your losses, most traders lose, lose money because they have a plan like this. They understand this. It falls. And then they say, you know what? I'm going to add more to my position because it's lower. And I think it's going to reverse, right? I think it's going to fall here and then reverse. Well, this is this is yeah, risk management is key. So this is this is the biggest issue. And maybe for that day trader, maybe it happens one time where it falls and then it reverses and then they end up green. And that's really to me the worst thing that can happen to you because then you think it may happen more often than not. And that's not what's going to happen the majority of the time. You know, usually if if this doesn't hold, it's just going to flush out and it may not go back on an uptrend. So this is just like one example of day trading. There's many day trading patterns and we're going to go over more, but this is just to give you an exposure to what the day trader thinks about um, this what one pattern they may look for. And and and, um, and Malik, you have anything else to add with uh, day trading? Nope, you're really hitting them all. Just um, always make sure you have a plan for what you're doing. Always make sure you've been watching that stock for a few days just so you understand its behavior. Does it make higher highs constantly? Did it make a lower low? Why did it make a lower low? Um, were there buying <coughs> buyers that came through? So you always want to have a plan, understand where you're entering, where you're exiting. Whether it's profit, whether it's a loss, you always yeah. have to have that plan. Yeah. And uh, someone said, I made that mistake on RBLT. Not sure what mistake you made, but RBT to me is more of a long-term hold, right? I've talked about that company before. And when I talked about it, I think it was trading at $10, $11 and it's trading at $6 now. So it's dropped a lot. But you know, overall, if you look at the whole growth sector, all stocks are dropping, right? Palantir is dropping, PayPal is dropping, everything is dropping, right? But if you have a company like RBOT that you've done research on, that you've done due diligence, and you know in your heart, just like Tom Nash with Palantir, Palantir is since you know he's been talking about it is down 40, 50%. It's crazy, you know, it's a lot, like all of Kathy Woodstock. If you're bullish on a company, uh I, I take care, man, invest story. Um, if you're bullish on a company, then and you have a thesis already for it, like I do for ROBT, I know it's dropped a lot. But I'm still going to hold it, you know, because I know in two or three years, let's say in two or three years, RBOT, right? Or, or you know, let me make an example. Amazon, right? When it was early, early on, let's it was trading at one, $130. And it went from $130 all the way down to, I think, below $10 or something, right? That's a big loss. But, like, let's say you held on and you didn't care because you knew how big Amazon was. And now Amazon's trading at thousands of dollars. 
do you really care about how much it dropped? Like ROBT, yeah, it hurts that when I was talking about it, it was $10, dropped to six. But let's say in two years, it's trading at $30. You're not even going to remember that it dropped to six. And that's what Tom Nash does with Palantir, right? His He believes in Palantir. It's down 40, 50% since he's talked about it. But in five years, if it's trading 3X, 4X, 5X times, you know, whatever the initial investment is, you don't really care. So you have to have that discipline. If you don't believe in the company, then you're not going to be able to hold it when it drops. The overall market is dropping. ROBT is down. I believe in ROBT. I'm holding it for the next few years. If I have extra cash and now that it's trading even cheaper, I'm going to jump in even more. That's not day trading. That's not swing trading. That's that's investment. That's growth investment versus value investment. So that's that's a little bit different. And we'll we'll get into those topics a little bit later. So long versus short trade. So when you're long, right, you buy a stock and and you and you uh, hold it, hoping to sell as it goes up. Right. That's what a long trader does. When you short a stock, I know you've heard short a lot because people get short squeezed and all that. Um, so when you short a stock, you're you're borrowing. So you have a broker, right? You have a broker. You see a company, let's say it's trading at $20. And you're like, okay, this company shouldn't be trading at $20. It's only up because of hype. It's only up because of something that's not sustainable. So I tell my broker, let me borrow a thousand shares of company XYZ. I want to short it. So you borrow a thousand shares of company XYZ from your broker and you sell it at $20. So that's $20,000 that you have credited to yourself. Now you owe your broker a thousand shares, not money. You don't owe them the 20,000. You owe them a thousand shares, right? And let's say you were right and uh, a few weeks later, it's down at $10. Now you have that $20,000 credit, right? Because you sold it at $20. You take half of that, the $10,000 to buy the thousand shares and you give your broker back the thousand shares and you keep the other $10,000. That's what shorting is. That's what the concept of shorting is. And, you know, they're, they're, you know, shorting is very well known. Uh, there's big institutions that short sell. And uh, when you, when you remember the AMC GameStop thing, that was the whole controversy because some of these companies were shorting it so much that they felt it wasn't fair. And then the community came together and started buying that stock and it spiked up. Now, when you want to get out of your short position, you have to buy stocks. So let's say I bought it here at $20 and the Reddit community is behind that company and it's at 40. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm down, you know, uh, 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 I'm the, I have a uh, thousand shares and it's up $20. I'm down $20,000, you know, so I have to buy a thousand shares here. And as I'm buying and everybody else is buying and getting out of their short position, it's causing the stock to go up even more because everybody has to buy the stock to get out of their position. And that's basically what a short squeeze is. And that's why you saw that what happened with GameStop and, any, and AMC and all those things. All right, so I just kind of want to show you, give you guys a little example, right? So let's say today I went and I bought Juan a brand new iPhone 13. So that costs about $1,000. And I said, Juan, I mean, Juan came up to me. He said, can I borrow your iPhone 13? I'll give it back to you in a year, right? This phone costs $1,000. We know that the iPhone, you know, loses value within a, within a year. So one year comes along and I don't go ask Juan for the money. I ask him for my phone back. Right. I told him he asked to borrow the phone, but he's going to return the phone. So he goes when he took the phone the first day, he sold it for a thousand dollars. A year later, that same phone, six hundred. So he pockets four hundred dollars, pays six hundred for the same phone and gives it back to me. And that is how you short. There you go. OK, so also uh, for the day trader, some traders trade pre-market um you see pre-market is very risky uh it's it's hard to identify you know resistance support but some people like trading pre-market these are the normal market hours normal market hours from um uh, 9 30 to 4 p.m and and nor so some people when they day trade though they do look at the pre-market right if for example a company pre-market spikes up to five dollars right here then it drops 
some com some some day traders during market hours say okay if it if it hits five dollars and it breaks five dollars i'm gonna jump in for the break of pre-market um so some people use pre-market in their strategy when they're day trading uh some people they trade after hours sometimes um there was like like um and, and one thing is like uh everything we're saying too is you it, the the more experience you have the more you see right so i've been trading close to 10 years so i've seen so many different trends Right. And there's been tr there's been like a, a trend where like for like five months, everything pre-market, if it got any type of news was spiking. And I actually recorded some of my uh, pre-market trades. I have them on another video where I jumped in because of the pre-market news and it spiked up and then it died out. And then the after hours was hard. There was a, 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 a time where after hours, anything after hours was trading uh, 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 super high. So the market goes through trends, but generally, you know, staying within the, the market hours is safe. Uh, Malik, do you trade pre-market or after hours? I don't trade pre-market after hours, but I base my trades very, very highly off of the pre-market and after hours for sure. Yeah. So so actually, and, and for me, one of my favorite strategies that I like, and we'll go over it later on when we go over strategies, just talking about um, pre-market uh, and, and my strategies, like when, when I first started trading, I would record all my trades on an Excel sheet and just keep them, keep them, keep them and look for trends, look to see what had the highest probability of success. What, you know, what had the statistically, what was my best trades. And one of my favorite trades that I liked was called the uh, pre-market breakout. So like, let's say you have a stock X, Y, Z, right? It That's spikes up. Certainly my favorite too. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I no, love no. It. it breaks out of pre-market retest yeah. and shoots volume. Oh yeah, my. yeah. Yeah, for sure. You see, you see, like uh and, and this is like uh me and Malik, like we didn't script this, right? So, like for both of us to get excited about a pattern, you can see okay, these guys are experienced, these patterns must work, right? So I have, for example, let's say stock X, Y, and Z is trading at ten dollars and pre-market spikes to 13, right? For me. Some of the rules that I applied for a pre-market breakout, it's it's it, let's say it, it spikes up to 13. I want to make sure it doesn't go back too much, right? Like let's say it, so let's say it goes to 13, then it drops to like seven. I, that's not gonna account for me. But let's say it goes to 13, then it pulls back to like eleven dollars, then it starts forming a channel, right? Now it's going between 11 and 12, 11, 12, 11, 12, close to 13, and it's forming this channel. So now if it forms that channel pre-market. After the spike, the bottom of that channel is uh, resistance and the uh, support and the top of that channel is resistance. And the bottom of that channel is my exit strategy. And, uh, you know, the top of that channel is where I'm going to jump in. So let's say during market hours now, you know, it's, it's, it's breaking out of that channel and it's about to hit 13 and there's like a bullish candle. That's my symbol to jump in. Right. So I jump in and uh, oh, Penny Slayer is here. I'm, I'm going to have him jump on in a little bit. So it jumps in. I jump in. I know that if it pulls back and it hits that support, maybe that's my exit strategy. But more than likely, it does have a, um, a pretty high chance that if it spikes up pre-market, then it kind of forms a channel. It doesn't pull back too much, but it forms a channel on the break of that pre-market high. That's where you want to enter. And you'll see usually you, you it usually follows by a nice little spike. So. This is just to give you an example of, you know, one day trading strategy. There's so many others, uh, but it's important that you get exposed to, to all different types of strategies. Um, so three, three, so even, so we have pre-market and we have after mar after hours, but even during the day trading, some day traders only like trading certain sessions. So I kind of made this to break down the session. So day, so, so the intraday trading is from 9.30 a.m. Eastern time to 4 p.m. Eastern time. And the first two hours, there's some day traders that only trade the first two hours. Why? Because that's when there's the most volatility. Um, some day traders don't trade at all during 11.30 to 1.30 because Wall Street goes to, um, uh, um, to lunch and there's not as much volatility. And then they have what they call the power hour, like an hour before the market closes. And a lot of day traders trade during that time uh, because there's more volatility. Uh, any, uh, what about you, Malik? What do you, what do you trade? Um, as, uh, you know, I have like hundreds of members who follow my trades. So I kind of like to sit there all day, 
but the most impactful times for me are between 9.30 to 10.30 and 3 to 4 p.m. Those are the most powerful hours. We call it power hour where the, the market's really uh, moving the way we want it. That's where they all come back and where everyone is actually actively trading. Yeah. So, I mean, and, and if you talk to, you know, um, uh, different day traders, uh, there's no there's no right or wrong answer. I mean, it's just a matter like what I want to get. A, the reason I brought on so many different guests, because I want to expose you to different styles. Maybe me and Malik are totally opposite on every single thing we talk about or we're totally alike. You know, um, but we, you see, we have some similarities. But the, the, the thing is, our our thesis, what we came down to is based off years of trading and what worked for us, right? Maybe um, somebody can't handle scalping, right? Because it's too much stress. It's too quick. It's too fast. Uh, maybe, you know, so maybe somebody just likes swing trading. Maybe some people only like trading these first two hours. Maybe somebody likes trading only the last hour. So everybody's a little bit different, um, but it's important you get exposed to all these different strategies to see if you want to day trade, what works best for you. So the key points Trading intraday and swing tradings have different strategies. Stocks can be bought long or short trade. Trading has different sessions. Any questions before we go on to the next module? Let's see. One second here. Hey, Penny Slayer, I'm, I'm putting a, a link out here. Okay, so the last module here is just some trading terminology. Um, so when you day trade, if you're going to start day trading, right? Like let's say you jump on Webull or Robinhood or uh, Lightspeed or Interactive Broker or whatever broker you use. If you start your account and it's under $25,000, then you're going to be restricted by the PDT rule. So the pay, uh, um, pattern day trading rule, basically within a five-day period, you can't buy and sell. If you buy and sell more, if you do uh, uh, like a round trip, a uh, buy and sell more than three times, let's say four times, then they're going to restrict your account. They're going to restrict your account for a certain amount of days, or if you deposit $25,000, they'll unrestrict it. So just understand that there's some ways around it. Like some people, uh, let's say you have $10,000 and you want to day trade more than once a day or more than three times within a five day period. Some people take that $10,000 and they'll open three accounts, right? They'll put like 3000 something dollars in three different accounts. Now you can trade with $3,000 on each of those accounts more than one day. Um, I would say though, I would say though, I, I like this because one of the, one of the things with trading, you get it, you can get like addicted or you can like have some psychological, you know, emotional breakdown where you see your money fall and you're like, okay, I got to jump back in and make my money back. So I like that there's some restriction, especially, you know, if you have a small account under $25,000, um, I don't know if it applies to Europe. I don't know the SEC rules in Europe. Um, especially if you have under twenty five thousand um, dollars, you know, like uh, it's a small account. Anything under twenty five thousand dollars is considered a pretty, you know, a small account. So I think in the beginning, if you have a small account, it's better that you take less trades, right? Because you want to learn. You don't want to learn uh, with a hundred thousand dollar account or two hundred thousand dollar account. So I'm I'm good for this. I don't think you should try to get around it by, by by getting multiple accounts. Or some people used to get around it by buying Caribbean accounts, like SureTrader used to be one. Um, uh, I don't remember some of the other Caribbean accounts right now, but some of those Caribbean accounts, they're it, probably the same thing as Europe. Uh, they probably fall under that they're not under SEC rules. Even though you're trading with a, Euro, uh, a Caribbean account in the United States. You still under, you know, since you bought, you have the account in a Caribbean account, like SureTrader is the only Caribbean account I can think of. There's, there's more though. Um, you're not under those SEC rules. So that one, they'll, they'll give you leverage, which I don't use leverage and they'll let you day trade as much as you want. Um, any, anything else, uh, Malik? 
nope, that's kind of it. I day trading. Um, just remember that if you might as well do a cash account if you don't want. Uh, you didn't get into that though, so yeah, just go ahead. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that's that's what I say. Look, cash account, you know, is is the way to go. Have patience, right? You know, cash account is exactly what it is. If you have ten thousand dollars in your account, that's what you have. Ten ca ten thousand dollar cash account. Now, a leveraged account. So if you have like ten thousand dollars, sometimes they give you four, uh, you know, four times more buying power or two times more buying power. What that means is, let's say you have a ten thousand dollar account and it's a leverage account times two, then you have twenty thousand dollars buying power, right? Now that sounds good, but if if for example, you know, you use twenty thousand dollars to jump into a position, and you say you buy um, a thousand shares of whatever, and it drops a whole bunch. Now, because you you you've leveraged, you're gonna lose a lot more. Even though you can make a lot more because you're taking bigger position, you can lose a lot more. And if you don't have a good strategy, and you don't have a good sense of day trading, then why risk it? Um, and then the leverage also it has interest, and there's other fees associated with it. Um, yeah, so on a cash account, you only pay commissions. Um, so with the leverage, you sometimes have to pay interest, which I don't pay. I don't use anything that has interest. Um, so leverage has interest and it's extra fees and it's higher risk of losing money. So just if you're going to get an account, just get a cash account and, and you'll be good. And like also it'll limit the amount that you sell. Um let me see. So yeah, so some people avoid the PDT rule. Like I said, they get multiple brokerage accounts or they get offshore account. I would say avoid these, uh, but I'm just exposing you to it. So you have an idea of, of what goes on. Um, so some people that like shorting, right? One of the things that they may see here, like if you have your, your broker, you might see is short sell restriction. And this rule came out in 2010. It's also to refer to as the alternate uptick rule, which means that you can only short a stock. Yeah, cash sounds more sensible. Absolutely, Rich. Um, cat only short a stock on the uptick. This is kind of an unusual thing when you first think about it, if it restricts ability to short. Okay, so sometimes they, they, they put this into place because um, of sometimes the negative impact that um, uh, uh, it can have on a stock if too many people short it. So if you see like, if you're a big person that, sh if you're somebody that has like major shorting strategy, right? And you see this pop up on your, your uh, level two here, you see SSR, short sell, short sell restriction. That means, uh, let me, let me pull up a chart here. All right. So we have a chart here. Hey, what's going on, Penny Slayer? Hey, how's it going? Hey. Good, good, good. Penny Slayer, Malik, Malik, Penny Slayer. Penny Slayer is, uh, um, has what's his Discord too. Always uh, good, Malik. How about you, man? Good, good. Just helping out the brothers here. Yeah, no, yes. I, I hear you, man. Listen, Juan, Juan hit me up and let me know that this thing was going down. I was like, I have to be a part of it. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. And we'll give Penny Slayer the floor in a few minutes here. But, you know, at any time, Malik and Penny Slayer, you want to add to whatever we're saying, please feel free. So let's say this was an intraday chart, right? And you want to short it, right? And you see this red candle here. You can't short it here if there's a short sale restriction. You have to wait till you see a green candle. Uh, where before you can short it. So that's that's all. If you see that SSR short sell restriction, if you're somebody that shorts, you can only short on the uptick of a green candle. You can't short it while it's while it's crashing down. Let's say a stock is crashing red, 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 red. You can't short it during that time if it's on short sell restriction. You have to see red, 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 little uptrend green, then red, 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 red. Yeah, and and there's a lot of risk, right? If you if you jump in a thousand shares um, at, at at five dollars, you know your risk is whatever you spent to get those five thousand shares. When you short, it's unlimited risk, right? Because remember, you have to buy back those shares. So if it's if you bought them at five dollars, uh, a thousand shares, that's five thousand dollars. Now let's say that you go to sleep and tomorrow that stock is trading at a hundred dollars. You have to buy back a thousand shares at a hundred dollars, you know, so it's unlimited risk with shorting.
there's some people that make so much money shorting that are really, really good shorting. Um, I'm not really big on shorting. I like to kind of like uh, uh, be positive and optimistic and, and feel that, you know, we're, you know, we're going to do well. Uh, but, you know, this is just uh, an example of you, something you may see if you're a shorter. Uh, Malik or Penny Slayer, anything you want to add to short sale restriction? So there's something called hard to borrow yeah, and uh, easy to borrow. So when you're getting something, I don't like to do either. If I want to short a stock, I'll play stocks. But for when you're playing a hard to borrow, you're going to be paying fees on that, right? So when it's hard <laughs> to borrow, the market actually has to go out there, look for shares that are either floating, which is tough. So they're, they're going to actually use shares from someone else's account. And they're going to give you those shares so you could short, so you could sell, and you're paying a fee on that. And if and sometimes you're be, you're pay, you're being charged interest if you're holding it for a certain amount of time, right? So fees, interest. Um, you you don't want to you don't want to accumulate fees and interest on yourself while you're trying to trade a position. And on top of that, you're getting com there's commission fees for the for the platform. All of those things are going to add up. So you got to make sure you're coming out the position pretty profitable so you could at least break even. You know what I'm saying? So shorting, not my favorite thing. I like to play the options when it comes to puts for shorting just because there's a lot of complications that you, that uh, I don't know if I used to do it on TD. TD could give you a lot of complications for that. Yeah. Um, and, and like I said, I'm not trying to build an echo chamber. I guess it's just some guys here that are not like really big on shorting. Uh, but there's some people, uh, like I know Steve Ducks and, and some other guys that are big on YouTube that love shorting and they've made a fortune on shorting. That's that's just not for me. Um, so here we have like an example of short screens. These are some older ones, dry ships, Volkswagen, the game stops, you know. And we just mentioned, right, like a short squeeze is like, let's say there's a ton of people shorting. There was a ton of people shorting this and it, it got a catalyst, right? Let's say dry ships got a big account or something that caused volume to come in you see all this volume it starts to spike up now the people shorting like oh my god i gotta buy back my shares before it goes any higher so they start buying buying their shares and as they're buying back their shares as people are jumping in buying it's causing this major short squeeze so you saw here it squeeze and then it crashed all the way back down all right so that's uh that's kind of like a short squeeze i think everybody knows what a short squeeze now a short squeeze is because of uh um of GameStop and all the stuff, it's it's pretty well known. Yeah. Um, and here's another broker, another thing that, and we, you know, um, the brother Malik touched on it. So short sale restriction. So when you short, we mentioned that you borrow shares from your broker, right? If it's easy to borrow, then you'll be able to borrow them, no problem. If it's hard to borrow, they got to find them other places. They got to look for it, and they're gonna charge you large fees. Sometimes, let's say you want to borrow a thousand shares. Let's say they're charging you a, a dollar for each share to borrow because it's hard to borrow. You gotta you gotta spend a thousand dollars just to borrow those thousand shares. And let's say that stock doesn't do what you thought it was gonna do. It's not like you get your money back once you borrow them. If it's hard to borrow or whatever, and, it, and whatever fees associated with borrowing those shares, even if you don't use those shares and short for that day, you still get stuck with those fees. And then tomorrow, I think the next day, I don't even think you have those shares anymore. So um, is it, do you, any of you guys know that if you borrow, I think the next day you don't have those shares anymore, right? You have to reborrow them. Um, if you pay the fee to borrow the share, no, you, yeah. you keep it shorted uh, until you actually buy the position back. No, no. Let's say, let's say I borrow shares of stock X, Y, Z, right? And I never use it. I already paid the fees. Um, I think there's a time, like, I, I don't know what the time period is, but I think there's a time like e you don't have those shares borrowed anymore. I think it expires or something. I don't know. I'm not really short or <laughs> not, my, okay. not my field. Yeah. E either way, though, let's say you borrow, you borrow shares, um, you pay those fees and whether you short it or not, you still those fees are paid for and, and you don't get that money back. So then there's a terminology called averaging down on your long position. So let's say you buy a thousand shares of XYZ at $10 and it drops to $8. You're still bullish on that stock for whatever reason. And you think that, you know, um, um, it's going to go back up and you buy another thousand at $8. Now your average position is $9 because you take 10 plus eight, 
and then divided by two, and that's your average position. Um, this strategy is very risky uh, for a day trader. Uh, it's okay for um, uh, uh, if you have a value investment or a growth investment and you're holding long term, like I did with RBOT. I, had, I bought it at eleven dollars, then it dropped to ten. Now it's down to six. So I bought more, uh, but I'm for RBOT. I'm not expecting return on that for the next for the next year or two. So for a day trader, it's very risky to to do this. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if you guys, uh, you know, most most day traders, they'll have a, a stop loss, and once it hits that stop loss, they're out. That's it. The inexperienced day trader, it pulls back and they say, you know what, I'm going to buy more. I think it's going to reverse. They don't have a plan. And then they, instead of losing uh, $1,000, they're down like $5,000. You know, that's why a lot of new traders don't don't last because they don't have a plan. Uh, anything you guys add for that? Uh, averaging down, just make sure it's a company that you truly, truly believe in to the max. Because I know someone who just averaged down on a failing stock for the past two years. And he's really mad. <laughs> he's really mad. I, it, oh, I think Malik, yeah. I think you accidentally muted yourself during your conversation, brother. <laughs> Hello? Yeah, there you yeah, go. Okay. So, and then there's some people, if you hear the word uh, um, averaging up a short position, right? It's the same concept as averaging down. But, you know, they're like it, it goes up. Uh, they, they get a thousand shares of X, Y, Z at ten dollars. Now it increases to twelve dollars. And they're like, OK, I, I, th I still think it's going to reverse. I'm going to get another thousand mm -hmm. shares at twelve dollars. And now they have two thousand shares. But their average cost basis is eleven dollars because they bought it at ten. They bought it at twelve. So if you had ten plus twelve is 20, uh, twenty two and then divided by two is eleven. So that's just some terminology that you may hear averaging down, averaging up. Okay, so trading halt. So trading halt is a temporary. If if you if you hear if you ever hear the terminology, hey, the stock is halted, right? It's something that the SEC uh, put into place, and it kind of gives everybody the time to reset, right? So let's say this stock has been climbing up. It's up, you know, five dollars, ten dollars, climbing up, climbing up. You see this big gap. This is a five minute halt. So meaning the stock, the 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 ticker stops. Everything stops. Nobody's trading it. Right. And then it's just a few minutes for everything to kind of like reset. And it, the trading halts are typically enacted of a news announcement or to correct an order of imbalance as a result of a technical glitch or due to regulatory concerns. Halts can last hours sometimes. Typically, though, the average halt that you see is because of of price movement spike. A lot of people are buying, buying, buying. So it stops for five minutes, meaning you can't buy or sell out of your position. And then it reopens. Um, so that's that's pretty much a halt. Um, it's just the SEC suspending the stock for a few minutes, five minutes. And it's always five minute periods. Right. So if it doesn't reopen in five minutes, then you have to wait for the 10 minute. If it doesn't reopen in 10 minutes, then you have to wait for the 15 minute. And it rarely, rarely breaks out of that five, five minute increments. OK. So we talk about low. We we mentioned it before. Uh, we talked about outstanding shares and we talked about float. So there's some traders that tr mostly trade, for example, low float stocks, right? So what um, float is like? Let's say every stock has a float, which is the number of outstanding shares available to trade in the stock minus the restricted shares or share shares um, held by insiders and employees. So shares. Sometimes you hear shares outstanding. And shares outstanding um, is kind of like all those things together. It's the, the, the shares that are out there circulating and also the shares here held by insider employees. Float is what's available to trade, right? So a low float stock is considered 10 million shares. Now, like it doesn't sound like a lot. I mean, it sounds like a lot, 10 million. But let's say you have 100,000 people trading one stock. Now, if they buy like a thousand shares, that makes up the majority of these low float millions of shares, which is going to cause like a super spike. It's going to cause massive movement as opposed to uh, what we said, like with Bank of America, which has an extremely high float. Even if there's a hundred thousand shares, um, you know, it's, it's not going to move. So here, like we have, for example, share float is 36 million, which is. You know, not too not too high, but not too low either. But let's look at Bank of America. 
Look how many shares they have. Eight billion, right? So if you had a hundred thousand people trading Bank of America and they each bought a thousand shares, that's such a small portion of this eight billion shares. Um, any of you guys know offhand a, a ticker with low float, uh, super low float ticker? I'm thinking. HM and why I think, I think it's financials do like BAC, I believe. Oh, BAC has high float. Bank of America has high float. Um, um low float. B uh, try D, uh, try DIT, Juan. DIT. Oh, yeah, look at this. Okay, look at this. This stock has less than a million shares circulating. Look how little, sh how many shares circulating, right? So look at, you, look at this. Look at, it's, it went from, on, this is in one day here. It went from $148 to $263. Now you're asking, how could it make such a big move from uh, 148 to uh, 263? You know, for, for one, one ticker, DIT, to make that movement go up almost over a hundred points, a hundred, you know, a hundred and something dollars in one day. That's, that's like crazy massive. And you ask yourself, how can a stock do that? Well, this is, this is why, because look how many shares circulating. So it goes back to supply and demand, right? If you know, and it's the same issue right now that we're having in the market, why inflation is so high because there's a bottleneck with shipping. Uh, you know, there was so much money being given out by the government. So, Oh, you know, everybody has money. So there's much more in need. People have much more needs. So it's, it's making everything more expensive, right? Now, the same thing here. If there, there must have been like a news headline, something that came out that caused people to, to get bullish on this. Everybody started jumping in and there's such a small amount of shares. So now it's like, if I got like the last 10 hamburgers in the world, right? Like, let's say we were at the end of the world and there's no more hamburgers. And Juan has the last 10 burgers and I get like 5 million people asking me for the 10 burgers. I'm not going to sell those burgers at, you know, McDonald's price. I'm going to, I'm going to be like, Yo, okay, uh, I got 10 million people that want to buy these 10 burgers. Okay. Uh, $5 million a burger. I'm going to sell it super high. That's the same thing here. First, you know, it got, you know, barely any movement, whatever, all these little movement. But on this day, something happened that it caused a lot of people to want to buy this stock and there's only this many shares circulating. So it caused it to go from 148 all the way to $263 in one day. You know, so Juan, that's, this, this reminds yeah. me of a, a, a stock that I traded at one point. It was a ticker symbol GLSI. And uh -huh. uh, yeah, this ticker went from $4 to $150 in one day, uh, or it may have been two days. Uh, but Let's see if you can see. Uh, you may have to go back a year. Yeah, there you go. Oh, yeah, right here. Look at this. Yeah. So it went for something. Yep. 158. That's crazy. Look at this. And look yeah, at the share. Like, yeah, you see this, right? Um, and, and then you see the low flow, only 3 million shares and circulating. Again, back to Bank of America, it has 8 billion shares circulating. So you, if you go back to Bank of America... You don't see the crazy big spike in one day, right? Because it takes long time for the movement to go up. It takes more people to buy it. Um, so the question here, is it better to swing trade, low flow, high flow? All that comes to your style of trading. Um, like, for example, I know Ross Cameron, right? Ross Cameron loves to trade low float stocks. He loves to scalp them. He loves low float stocks because of the movement that comes with low float stocks. And you're right. Low float comes with high risk. Uh, while high float comes with less risk. Yeah, absolutely. I personally, um, I don't trade low float stocks that often. It, it just has to be like a perfect trade and maybe a pre-market breakout type of thing or something. Just it's something I have to be comfortable in, but I'm not like out here scanning for the lowest float stocks all day and trying to find, you know, scalp. that's just not my style. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit more laid back and, and that ain't my style. Yeah, most of the time, if I'm looking for a swing trade, what I'm looking for is confirmation, right? And that's usually, yeah. uh, you know, green candles being built past its old highs. And you can actually see there in, in Bank of America, if you go back to it, uh, there's a, a confirmation that Bank of America was going to see new highs after it reached its new highs. So 
uh, there in 2010, or is that 2020 there? Yeah, right there. So where it breaks that old high, you can see that momentum traders see this as an opportunity to swing into a trade. That's called confirmation. And uh, that's that's the way that, you know, I like to take my trades whenever I'm looking into to swing things over the weekend. Now, as far as being like high float or low float, so it's a little riskier with low floats just because in a blink of an eye that you can really get your trade to go the opposite direction. So, uh, you know, higher floats are easier to uh, swing into the next day than penny stocks are, if you will, or low float, low cap stocks. Hey, absolutely. Hey, take care, Chris, man. Thanks for coming in. Um, yeah, so that's that's. Um, yeah, absolutely. Like what, what, what Penny Slayer just said, uh, and we're going to talk about it, too, later on. He wait. He waited for confirmation, right? So he said, um, "What area was it? I don't remember where you said, but let's say it was right here, right?" Yep. Let's say he was looking at it here. He's saying, "You know what? I want to see what it does here at forty three, forty three. It's it's starting to test it. I get a confirmation by a green candle. I get a confirmation by these moving averages showing me that it's an uptrend. Um, if he likes to use the MACD, there was a crossover." Uh, if somebody that likes to use the RSI, they say, okay, it's not um, overbought. Uh, so they, they have all these the stochastic. Some people like the stochastic. It's on an uptrend. So they get all these confirmations. It's on an uptrend. It's breaking out. Then I get a confirmation by this green candle. I'm jumping in because you have all those things in your favor. So that's why you take the trade. And it can still go the opposite way, but you're giving yourself the best chance for success by putting all those things in your favor. Have and I like to high probability, exactly. Yeah, higher probability. For me, my style is I like confluence, right? So I like to take static and dynamic indicators and meaning like, so the MACD, this is like lagging a little bit, right? You can't just depend on the MACD. If you actually backtest uh, the MACD on, on a lot of stocks and just use the MACD, you have a less, of, less than 40% chance of being a successful trader if you just use the MACD. So I like to use uh, multiple indicators then I like to use the price action. I like to look at volume. I like to look at green candles. And that's how I'm combining that static and dynamic, those static and dynamic indicators into one thing until I have all those things working together in one thing, in, in one spot. And I say, I'm jumping in here. So uh, that's low float versus high float. You see like the, you're going to see these crazy spikes on the low float and you're going to kind of see that steadiness on the high float. Uh, other lingo, uh, you're going to hear high of day, a HOD, uh, high day, highest price, the current market day, lower day, 52-week highs. Some people look at the 52-week highs because they say, okay, if it breaks the 52-week high, I may jump in, uh, but I need other confirmation. Um, there, and there's a bunch of term terminology like diamond hands, paper hands. Um, I sold out. I, I made a, I, I got called, I, I got called the uh, paper hands once. I sold out of a position once and somebody said, oh, you paper hands. And I was just like, oh, okay, whatever, man. Yeah, but it's did you like, take profits. I mean, that's the important part, right? I, I, I took a lot of profits, yeah, but you know, yeah, it wasn't it was it wasn't enough. I didn't take a hundred percent of my profits, you know. I didn't get to the top, you know. I was I was but you know, it's like that Monday night quarterback, like it's just like the Monday <laughs> night quarterback. It was a Monday night quarterback thing. He, it's actually still in one of my videos. Like the comment was like you sold out of your position because you have paper hands. And I was just like, yeah. Man, this guy's this guy's a clown. You know, compounding gains is one of the best things I've ever learned. Absolutely. Um, another common lingo that you may hear is the red to green move. So when a stock is trading below its previous day closing price, it is considered to be red. Whereas if it's trading previous day closing price is considered to be green. Uh, so sometimes, you know, it'll, it's red, 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 and then it makes the big green move. Some people look for like a position like right here, right? Where this is, there was resistance here in the past. They see the uptrend. They see that it, it broke here. It broke from the previous resistance and it gave you some strong green candles some people may jump in that. Uh, daily range uh, is another terminology that you may hear. And it's basically how much does a stock move intraday? It is a former runner. Some people like using uh, um, certain indicators just to see how much range that stock moves within a day. Um, and it, it'll kind of like um, um, make them decide if they're going to trade that, if that's a, a good stock to day trade. You guys have anything to add to that daily range and any indicators and stuff? No. Uh, like LOD, low of day, EOD, end of day, HOD, high of day, ATH, all time high. Um, I could I could make like a list and send it and send it somewhere. Off. The acronym list is long. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a there's a bunch, and I I only just expose you to a, f a few because that's I didn't want to waste too much time on on uh, terminology when you can you know it's so easy to Google. Um, but that's it. That's that was module one, two, and three. Brief introduction. Uh, let's see here. One second. So. Next week, we're going to be going over strong account stocks um, if we have time. Every week, too, we're going to be having guests, too. So if we're going to have guests, I'm going to kind of like put it on hold because uh, we'll have uh, next week. We have Sean from We Are Investing. So we can we can do uh, these modules with Sean and Sean will also add. And we'll still have hopefully Maddie will be here next week, too. Uh, and then at 12 o'clock next week, we're going to have an accountant. So save your accounting questions like I'm, I'm not going to answer any accounting questions especially uh since we're going to have an accountant here why would i why would i waste your time same time next week yes uh but before we go uh if penny slayer and malik can just add like the importance of community and having a discord and what you know what what they offer for their communities uh so penny slayer go ahead the floor is yours man uh yeah i mean so we uh have lucrum investing this is our community that we trade in and uh you know one of the things that we you know, based our community off of is uh, content, right? And and some of the things that, you know, day traders look for or people that are getting involved in, in you know, investing, they're looking for help and uh, understanding of the market. And this is just a good way to sort of bounce ideas off of each other. So we created this, this uh, Discord where we have over 40 analysts that are, you know, all about their technical analysis and all trade in different ways. We all know that there's thousands of different ways to trade the market. And so we offer this as an opportunity for everyone to get involved and start bouncing ideas off of each other. It's a very good community. It's a good way to get news. You know, there, there's like so many things that you can get involved with here uh, that we offer. Uh, you know, like for instance, the, the Hindenburg guy on, on Twitter who single handedly, in my opinion, brought down Nikola uh you know i think that this is just more news and more information at your fingertips here in the community that we offer a lot of due diligence channels a lot of uh bots that help you understand um you know some of the dark pools and the gold sweeps that happen during the day you can always have that type of information at your hands too if that's something that you're willing to dig down deep into and understand but the the community here is great uh, we have over 40 analysts, we have 13 help analysts, and we have 10 moderators. So, you know, if you're looking for a safe place to come and just hang out, this is it. This is your spot. And I know um, Nortrades also has his own that he does. Uh, you know, it's just a, a community aspect to this whole thing is is really where we like to take advantage of yeah. you know, bouncing ideas off of each other. Yeah, so I, I I've I've been on this. Um, you know, you see here like Dark Pool, for example. You you know, most of the time you have to pay a different membership just to get like Dark Pool alerts. You get that here. They have a, a bunch of books to ebooks that you can find, like ebooks that you would spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on if you bought them all. They're here free. And I I come here. Um, you see here, I have my channel here too. So I jump on here. I'm a part of this. I like it. Um, and you know, I, I like it a lot. So NAR, NAR has this community too. NAR, if you want to speak on that, I'm also here with NAR. Uh, I help out with NAR too. Yeah, for sure. So, um, our channel is basically primarily focused on growing the average trader, whether you're a beginner, whether you're intermediate, we like, like uh, Penny Slayer said, it's great to bounce ideas off each other. Right. So I have a team of 10 to 15 really high stack traders that come on voice every single day and we trade live right so we see a play we tell you we're taking uh tesla 1000 call uh this week expiration and i tell you when to enter when to exit right we do it on voice chat mostly uh for the past like month we've been doing voice plays only because um you know the market's shaky so i don't want to type a play out and then five minutes later you know what i'm saying that's why if you're on voice chat with me, we're able to stop loss as quick as we, we're able to do anything else, right? So yeah, exactly. What we do here is we kind of show you what it's doing for the day and where we would take our entry into position if this was broken with volume or, you know, my brother likes to use the TTM squeeze indicator, which is right there on the bottom. Yeah. And he re, you know, he he called out that big drop right there where, where your mouse is a little to the left, you know, right at that break because of, you know, the squeeze, the volume, 
the way it's behaving, the way it's moving, the way you see the um, the way you see the momentum shift start to shift downward, right? It was moving strong upward a lot, and then it started making let lower higher highs, and then eventually we made a lower low, right? So when we put all these things together, and you're in voice chat with us, and you're listening, and we're explaining to you the squeeze of what's happening and the breakout and what we want after the breakout. That's kind of, I'm giving you the, the bread and butter to how to option trade, right? You want to have the patience. Trading is 90% sitting there and waiting and 10% actually executing your trade, taking the entry, taking the exit, right? Um, so yeah, that's what we offer. I also have something separate, right? Which is a four week course. It starts February 15th. Um, do it monthly, uh, four weeks three days a week, two hours each day. And you basically learn everything you need from indicators, patterns, volume, fundamentals, what a stock is all the way to the most complicated strategies of selling to open, understanding how to sell to open credit, debit trades, um, uh, and all of that. And then you also get six free months only if you don't want, if you take my course, you get six free months in my channel, right? So, um, I, I'm here really trying to grow a community of people who are truly trying to learn how to trade more on the side of day trading, um, options trading, but I do teach you how to trade stocks or the general, um, understanding of stocks as well. If yes, you yes. want to give me a follow on Instagram, sorry about that. If you want to give me a follow on Instagram, nar.trades, um, that'll be Penny Slayer. Absolutely. What's your Instagram? I want to follow you. Absolutely. Yeah. And that, that's what it's about. It's about community. Um, I, these guests are coming on for the next few weeks. They're coming on, you know, for free and just, just out of, out of uh, co community and, and helping each other out. Um, I, I, these two guys, I like these two guys. I haven't participated much yet. Uh, but I, um, after probably starting in March, I'm going to become a lot more active day trading. So you're going to see me day trade live on YouTube, or you're going to see me day trade live with Penny Slayer or Malik. Uh, I'm going to be a lot more active in March. It's just a, it's a busy month for me, a lot of traveling. So, uh, I look forward to seeing you guys there. And like, like I said, like when we get to that point, when we finish, someone asked about, is there, is there a danger of being overloaded with information? Yeah, absolutely. That's why we're limiting this to an hour, an hour and a half give you some exposure to modules. That's why I, I said like uh, um, all, all these guys, what they're talking about, it, uh, I'm taking this course. Uh, that's why I talked about like the the discords. It's more resources. It's like it, it's like a, you're, you're if you're a, 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 an electrician or someone, you're only as good as your tools, right? And if you have more tools, you have a, a, a drill as opposed to a power drill. Now the power drill person is gonna finish faster. And you know, so it's just having resources. Um, and then once you get to a point where you have a good foundation, actually trading with a mentor. I'm I'm very open. You know, I'm uh, these discord these communities are very open. So if you had like a bad trade, you can show me your trade. You know, I, I have no problem just seeing your trade. Hey, why you jump? You know, and ask you why'd you jump in here? Like, uh, let's see if we can pull up a chart. Like if I say, okay, um, why you jump here? What made you jump in here? And I said you should have looked for this entrance. You should have, uh, um, you should have, you should have waited for this confirmation. I'll say, okay, this is the TTM squeeze. You're supposed to wait for the first green after a long period of red, but you're supposed to not just depend on the TTM squeeze, like here, like because look at the RSI, it's oversold. So why did you jump in here? You should have looked at the RSI, it's oversold. You know, what I mean, so just like, just like kind of like sharing information like that. Um, hold on here. Uh, is this going to be live? Be, yeah, it's going to be live. It's going to be recorded. You're going to find it on my channel. Hey guys, make sure I, I, I hate being the guy that's like, uh, hit the like, but hit the like, you know what I mean? All, no, that ain't my style. Uh, uh, but hit the like, uh, just hit the like, man, please. Like we're all, we're all here trying to, uh, be a part of the YouTube algorithm and be the, the algorithm's friend. So that, you know, that's really important. Um, is there, if there's any more questions, I'll give a couple more minutes for questions. We got two good guys here. Uh, great services. If, 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 um, uh, um, if you're interested in anything on my channel, on my, any videos, I have links to Penny Slayer. I have links to Malik. Malik has a great trial. Penny Slayer, you get all that stuff, like all the free eBooks, all the analysts, and it's only $34 a month, I think. $34.99. Um, yep. Yeah. So, so hit the link if you're interested, you know, if you don't like it, then, you know, then, then uh, uh, after a week, uh, you know, just just withdraw. You know, what I mean, it's it's no problem. Uh, next week again, we're gonna have Sean from We Are Investing, uh, and we're gonna have an accountant 
and um and whoever else is on live so any more questions i'll give you guys uh, another minute or two and then um i don't want to take these guys uh precious time on a saturday i mean it's the the weekend right before valentine's day man you know i'm a busy guy <laughs> that's it that's it or or, or or super bowl man super bowl right. tomorrow yeah that too super bowl is more my language <laughs> there you go you guys going for uh, uh who are you guys rooting for in super bowl Bengals, baby oh Bengals, you Bengals? really Dude, joe burrow huh you must have some joe burrow uh joe burrow fan but I love after the baby. super bowl Yes, um, he he has. I I set up a um, a free trial, and you click on my link, and it'll give you a free trial. I think it's seven days or something. So you know, get on, you get on, and then like let's say on day six, it's it's not for you. It's possible. I'm sure that you know it's it's not for everybody. There's nothing forced. Um, you click on my link, you get seven day on day six. If you're not happy, then you know then then just withdraw. No hard feelings. And if you like it, then, you know, then, then stay on and, and benefit. And, and uh, I'm sure like after the first month, you'll get some alerts that'll, that you'll make your money back. All right. Um, if you guys are going to be on here next week, it'll be the same time. Please get, get your tax questions. Um, the difficult tax questions, uh, you know, uh, we're going to have an, a snapback accountant. He's, he's popular. He's on Instagram, real good guy. And he's a, he's a certified accountant, CPA. And he'll be able to answer all your uh, uh, accounting questions that you're going to have, especially with day trading. It gets a little bit more tricky. So if there's no more questions in 10, 9, 8. All right. Well, again, Penny Slayer, thanks for coming on. Malik, thanks for coming on. Appreciate uh, you guys. Yeah, man. Time. See you yeah, guys next week. Far. Appreciate right. it. Take, right. guys. Take care, guys. See you.